Welcome back to the Stigma Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Hayes. Today's episode is a bit unique. It is a recording of a presentation and a Q&A session with Tom Insel. Tom is a neuroscientist. He's the former director of the National Institute of Mental Health. He's a co-founder of MindStrong, among many other things that he's done. He's also been tapped by the governor of California to be his right-hand person on all things mental health in the state of California. I could go on all day about Tom's bio, but I will link to that more in the show notes. Tom's currently working on a new startup in the mental health space, as well as a few other really interesting things that I believe will significantly advance the space. We recently hosted Tom for a private Zoom call with 25 mental health startup founders that are currently taking part in the first cohort of the What If Fellowship, where Tom joined us as a speaker. And he gave this great overview of the mental health landscape, what's broken, what needs to happen, his key learnings from the space over several decades of working at the strategic level to improve access to effective care in America. He also took questions from the attendees and gave these really incredible insights into these questions, which come from the perspective of early stage founders trying to build companies in the mental health space. I learned a lot from this discussion and so much from his answers to the questions that I just felt compelled to share this with everyone, you know, with Tom's permission, of course. This was recorded from a Zoom call, so the quality isn't perfect. So I hope you'll overlook that and be able to take away something useful as I did. If you're a founder of a mental health startup or an investor interested in the space or a person curious about why our mental health care system is the way that it is, then this conversation should be rather helpful to you. It was really enlightening for me. So with that said, let's get to the replay. Guys, I'm excited about this. I'm excited about having Tom here to set the table a little bit. The What If Ventures group, we've started a fellowship. It's a program to help mental health startup founders you know, kind of go from that super early stage, you know, maybe idea, maybe maybe post idea, or maybe they even started an MVP or they have a deck or they've started building their business and help them go from that place to, you know, ready to raise money and, and execute that. So that's what we've done here. It's an eight week program. This is actually week one of the first cohort. So you're along for, for the early days. Um, you're in early, which you've been early in a lot of things. So I think you, you understand how that feels. So to the folks here, Tom is an incredible human being. Okay. And he's probably going to get mad at me for tooting his horn a little bit too much, but Tom was the head of the NIMH. He's the mental health czar of the state of California. He's the founder of MindStrong. He's an investor in mental health startups. He's got another mental health startup that he's building right now. He's really honestly like a godfather of this whole industry in a way. And so you know, early in my days of trying to figure out what I was going to do in this space, you know, I, I reached out to Tom and he he took a cold LinkedIn message from me and took a phone call and has been kind to me and given me good advice and, and has been a friend and we've, we've shared ideas. And and honestly, he got me into the MindStrong deal. So he, he's been a big part of how I've been able to, to build what if, to be honest. And, you know, I wanted to have him come here tonight and talk to you guys and tell you a little bit about you know, building a business in this space, the problem, the solution, uh, or the potential problems, the potential solutions, how he's built businesses, how he's raised money, what that dynamic is like and his experiences. And then, you know, at the end, we'll, we'll open it up to some Q&A. And I think he'd be, he's a great person to ask some, some of your high-level strategic questions about, about operating in this space. So without any further ado, Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you. Feel free to screen share or you know, talk about whatever's on your mind. And I, I think Everybody here will, will learn a great deal from just hearing you, you know, kind of share whatever's on your mind that, that you would want to tell early stage founders in this space. Well, hey, it is great to be doing this. I'm really honored to be a part of the process. I feel like I'm an early stage founder myself, so I'm kind of interested in being part of the conversation. I'll make some remarks, but Stephen, I think mostly it would be great if we could turn this into a discussion. Stephen asked me to say a little bit about how I got to where I am. And I just, just put this slide together last night and realized it anything but a linear journey. I've done a lot of different things in a very long career. A friend of mine said that I, I seem to be one of those people who keeps falling up in the sense that I've had a lot of really interesting jobs and sometimes feel like I haven't quite finished the last one before I've gone on to the next one. But if we just go to the bottom of this, uh, being in the private sector now, both with a, a new startup and also trying to get a venture fund going, it was a really interesting time to be doing that right now. I'm also, as it's, you see the final part of that, I'm spending a lot of my time, especially this 
month trying to finish a book on um, the future of mental health care. The book's called Recovery. That'll be out next year. Penguin Random House. A little bit of it's about innovation. A lot of it is about uh, the things we all need to do to build a better mental health care system and a better society around that. So uh, that's me very quickly. Look, we're at this interesting moment. Uh, Who would have thunk that uh, 2020, which has has been such a year of woe, would be such a year of of wow when it comes to investment in uh, behavioral health or digital health? These numbers just are just out from Rock Health last, I guess, on Monday. And they're showing that uh, what they're calling Q3 for 2020 is the biggest quarter ever. They're looking at potentially, at this rate, about $9.4 billion coming in for digital health this year. You know, as you can see from the graph, way ahead of uh, all previous years. This is just a growing and growing market, 800 deals in this particular year, if I'm reading this right. So that is uh, pretty extraordinary. What adventures and Stephen have mapped out the landscape for behavioral health specifically, previous slide was digital health generally. I'm sure all of you have seen this at one time or another. Interesting for me, and I guess some of this is outdated, but just the numbers are mind boggling. And we're talking about now, I think the number, Stephen would say, is up over a 1,000 startups. And the the amount of money coming in is probably in the $5 billion or something like that range. So huge, huge market, a lot of activity. What I find interesting is the way that it breaks down with, and, and there are lots of ways to slice this, but digital therapeutics, wellness, telehealth seem to be the big areas. If you ask me, like, where is the field going? And this would be fun for us to talk about because I'm sure all of you see this through a different lens. But to me, they're just maybe three or four big trends. The, the biggest one, which is really over the last decade, is that in behavioral health, in contrast to every other part of medicine, the flow is going from specialty care to primary care. Every other part of medicine, endocrinology, infectious disease, almost any other area you want to think about, primary care is now handing off patients to specialty care. But in behavioral health, the flow is going the other direction for a lot of reasons, which we can talk about. There is, of course, during COVID, this massive shift from brick and mortar to remote telehealth. There was a piece out yesterday in the report from Boston, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. They had 200 claims for telehealth in February of this year, 200 claims. In May, they had 38,000. So get some sense of how that landscape has shifted from what was 5 to 6% in most, most markets being uh, telehealth to now over 90% in most markets. Will it go back to 6%? Probably not. Will it stay at 90 95%? Probably not. It'll probably end up somewhere in the middle, but we're um, into a new era in terms of how care will be delivered. Big change that's really happened even during COVID, during the pandemic, is this the sweep up, the consolidation, huge M&A efforts, mostly now not from venture, but from private equity, buying up individual private practices and creating these massive group practices. So um, I guess the most significant one is um, Life Stance, which is in six or eight states at this point, recently purchased by Texas Pacific Group for $1.2 billion. What did they do? They went, over, they went around and convinced these individual private practices, usually social workers, marriage and family therapists, that they'd have more negotiating power for reimbursement if they banded together. Life Stance provided almost like a union. They provided the umbrella for that. They don't do much in the way of innovating on those practices. It's, it's simply a matter of um, the major consolidation and sweep up. The last thing I'd say is, though we talk a lot about the shift to value-based care, it still isn't really happening in most of the places I look. There's some work in this space, some progress in the Medicare Advantage space where people are going at risk, but for the most part, for behavioral health, we're still very much a fee-for-service, volume-based kind of a, an approach. And whether that will change in 2021 or not, it's going to depend on a lot of things, mostly around what 
CMS, Medicare, Medicaid end up doing. The main point I wanted to make before we get into a longer discussion with all of us is that if you think about that, what if ventures slide and you ask like, where's the money going? And by money, I mean like the $5 billion or whatever that number is that's going into behavioral health. A lot of it's gone into the wellness space. And you can think of that as, you know, the calm and headspace and, you know, the fitness industry where you're doing mindfulness, but it's really not getting at some of the major issues in behavioral health. A lot of activity in just building companies that do matching. So they help primary care to find specialty care or help individuals or employers to find therapists, Lyra Health quartet. There's a bunch of them. They don't actually change the practices. It's really, it's almost, in fact, when Lyra Health started, they brought in somebody from Tinder to help them learn how to do matching algorithms. That's all there is to this. It um, serves a need. It's been a good business. Lyra has done very well uh, in terms of raising money. Will it change outcomes? Will it change the way mental health care is delivered? I don't think so. But it's allowed us to as a kind of put a Band-Aid over some of the problems in the current healthcare system. Telehealth, I mentioned already, you know, huge issue right now. And you've got lots of companies that have grown super big, super fast, Teladoc, Genoa, a bunch of others around just providing access. Again, what's interesting if you look at that is they're not really doing anything that innovative. They're helping people to do what used to happen offline to now happen online. So yes, they fix the access issue to some extent, but do they improve outcomes? Do they improve care? Do they give you something you didn't have before? Remains to be seen. And finally, you know, a lot of interest in digital therapeutics. You've got Pair, Pair uh, Achille, a few other companies that are coming up with interesting uh, hardware or software to try to provide uh, something that could get through FDA, be prescribed like a drug, and yet be in the software space. Again, I, you know, uh, Pair is an interesting company to follow. They have in licensed a huge number of digital therapeutics. Um, they're a very well-run company, uh, very visionary. How well that's going to play out um, as a business, I think, still remains to be seen. The piece that I wanted to share with you is I spend a lot of time thinking about like, what are we missing here? Like, you know, what are the areas that either aren't getting funded or aren't growing yet? Sometimes at the venture fund, we call this the concepts in need of companies. And maybe some of you are thinking about some of these things as well. I'd love to hear about that. The areas that I think about are kind of where is the public health need? So certainly serious mental illness and dealing with not with the fitness wellness community, but with people who are often on the in the public sector getting Medicaid or not getting care, ending up in the criminal justice system, ending up homeless. Huge need to provide recovery services, a huge opportunity, I think, to do something really great uh, in the public health sense. Also something that is costing the country a huge amount of money. So it means there's an opportunity to build a business there as well. Big need, not just for matching, but for the real integration of care. So creating um, online or digital tech-enabled collaborative care. Collaborative care is the term of art for providing behavioral health within the primary care setting. And um, that gets paid for right now. There are 37, 38 RCTs that show that this gets you better outcomes, whether it's for depression or diabetes. Super important to do. A couple of companies like Concert Health and a few others, uh, Mindula, Valera, beginning to do some of this, but still small potatoes compared to what the enormous market should be. My big thing is the third bullet here. You know, I think we've focused way too much on access and way too little on quality. And the real promise of uh, innovation is to improve the quality of care. And we can say a lot more about this, but for me, quality means you are um, collecting measurement, that you're looking at outcomes, you're getting feedback, you're creating a learning healthcare system, and you're giving something to people that we don't have right now, which is even when they do get access through telehealth, they're often not getting the treatments that actually work 
or they're not getting them at the dose that actually is required. And the final point here in terms of following the need is, you know, the this whole issue around engagement, which gets into the direct-to-consumer space. We know, you know, when you look at this as a problem that more than 50%, about 60% of the people who would benefit from care are not in care. The numbers are really stunning. When people do go for care, if they're trying to get psychotherapy from a therapist, the mean number of visits is just slightly over one. So they, you know, 1.4, they go maybe after usually a very significant delay and they don't come back for a lot of reasons. But this is a problem in behavioral health that is much, much greater than any other part of healthcare. Most of the people who would benefit don't get the benefit because they don't engage. It's easy to point fingers, but I think this is one that we've got to own, that whatever it is we as a field are um, selling, it's not what people are buying. and It's not what they want. And um, you need only look at what they are able to get from social media, from Amazon, from the world of goods and services and the way they're delivered in 2020, and look at what we do in behavioral health care, and it's pretty clear uh, we got a problem. Second area, as I just mentioned, is quality, that when people do get care, it's delayed, it's fragmented, it's episodic, it's often in the middle of a crisis. It's not the way anybody should or would want to get help, and yet that is still um, the rule, not the exception for the way behavioral health care is delivered. And finally, a point that I'll probably come back to a few times, and maybe we can talk about it further in discussion, is just the total lack of any kind of objective measurement. There are no biomarkers in this space. We don't measure anything. And, and as all of you will know, you can't manage what you can't measure. And in this field, the lack of measurement means that we're not doing a good job of managing either symptoms or functional outcomes, which are far more important. We have the, the means to do this. It just doesn't happen. We don't do it. So getting to the solutions and these are sort of just, again, the 30,000 foot view that I've kind of come to, and I'm sure it will evolve. And I may give you, if we're doing this a month from now, it might be different. I'm pretty impressed that the solutions that are probably going to work the best are not pure tech solutions, but they're going to combine tech and touch. And thinking about how to provide what some people call tech-enabled care is probably the place where behavioral health startups are going to get the most leverage. It's not going to be enough just to do measurement. You've got to provide care on top of that. And you've got to have the measurement inform the care and the care inform the measurement. So a kind of closed loop learning healthcare model with high tech and high touch is uh, an area that I think has got a huge amount of promise where we're going to see a lot of companies emerging. I think we all have to recognize that uh, as much as we would love to think that there's going to be a pill or there's going to be a, an app, it's not going to work that way. These are complex problems uh, for which there aren't going to be simple, single solutions. We're going to need a more comprehensive networked approach, uh, which involves tech, it involves touch, it involves connections that are social, and involves a whole bunch of things. I talk a lot in uh, the book I'm writing is about, it's called Recovery. And a lot of it is about what I call the three Ps, which is what you need for recovery. The three Ps are I used to say it must be Prozac, Paxil, and psychotherapy, but actually it's three very different Ps. Three Ps are people, place, and purpose. That to recover, you need social support. You need a safe place to live, which most people with SMI may lack. And you need something to live for. You need a job or a purpose. So when I say no magic bullets, I mean really where the solutions are going to come from in behavioral health is beginning to engage on all of those far more complicated uh, long-term sorts of interventions. Whatever we develop, I think really does have to either save money or time or both. I often tell the story of meeting with um, CMO at Kaiser Permanente when I was still at Google, and we were um, pitching this ability to give them just enormous amounts of elegant data about all of their patients with depression. And he turned to me and he said, why would I want that? We don't have time to look at all the data that's in the electronic health record. Like, what? we want more data. Just give me something that will save me money or time or hopefully both. And, and I think that's a really important point to remember that at least if you're going to work within the healthcare system and if you want adoption by providers, 
you got to solve a problem. And the biggest pain point for them is time. And you've got to make it. So whatever it is, it's got to be really simple. Green light, yellow light, red light. And it's got to be really efficient. It can't add, as the CMO said to me, if it adds a nanosecond to what our providers have to do, it's a non-starter. If it saves five minutes, we've got something to talk about. So I want to finish up by just sharing, but I don't know whether to call these lessons learned or just strong opinions, but having been in a bunch of companies and having invested a lot recently and having watched a lot of companies do well and a lot of companies not do well. And I'd love to get Stephen to work on this as well. I'd love to hear his thoughts about this. But I try to put down, even in my pitch deck, I have a slide like this. I put down, you know, what have I learned and what do I think are important rules to live by? So the first one, and this is in every presentation I give, I make the point that the behavioral healthcare system that we have today is really busted. I mean, it's just not working for anybody. It's largely built for providers and payers, maybe mostly for payers, but also for providers, but not for consumers and not for families. But nobody likes it. Nobody's happy with what we have today. And that is a fantastic opportunity. I think if, when I was pitching my current company, Humanist, to VCs, I was really amazed. They may understand digital health and they may understand issues around healthcare broadly, especially cancer and kind of life sciences and, and CRISPR, which is in the news today with the Nobel Prize. You know, if you've got something that uses CRISPR or a liquid biopsy or any, I mean, they got that. They'll grok with that in a moment and they love to put money behind it. But they really have a hard time understanding behavioral health, especially if there isn't a simple device, a simple hardware or software solution. It's very difficult for them to grasp. When they keep asking questions like, uh, show me your product roadmap, and you say, my product is outstanding clinical care, which is, by the way, what consumers and families want, they don't get it. They will have a really hard time trying to make sense of that because it doesn't fit into the two buckets that they know, which are software and hardware. You could say, well, we use software to improve care, and then they'll start to really focus on that. They want to see all of the wireframe diagrams and the, you know, the product roadmap around that software, but very hard for most VCs to understand the value of improving outcomes or improving care. There's a lot of information about what it is that consumers and families want. I mean, IDEO has done a lot of work on this, but there's a wonderful project that Mental Health America did. They asked, they had 5 million people who filled out online surveys that were looking at kind of uh, rating scales. Uh, and they asked them afterwards for those who who uh, scored in the severe mental illness range, what, what are you looking for? What would you want? And it turns out that what most people wanted was information, or as they said, a chance to talk to someone like me, meaning somebody with the same sort of problems. They weren't looking for medication. They weren't looking for long-term therapy. They weren't looking for apps. They weren't looking for a lot of the things that we think about. And I think that's an important lesson. One of the things that I've learned that's been incredibly helpful on the engagement piece is that if you give people a chance to help themselves and help each other, you can really get their attention, especially empowering people to help each other, like using what AA does, where you come into a community and not only get help, but give help. That piece of giving help is probably the most engaging, most empowering, most effective thing that we can do. As it says here, you know that does provide agency, has to build trust, transparency is super important here for that whole engagement piece. Somebody said to me early on that it's, and you guys who are just starting may not believe this, but that companies die much more often of indigestion than starvation. That what happens and often kills companies early on is they take more money than they need in the first round, especially right now when there's a lot of money out there from VCs wanting to do bigger and bigger seed rounds and wanting to get more and more of your ownership stake. And so you, you don't want to dilute too early. So don't take money that you don't need. But most of all, what I've seen happen, and I won't name the companies, but I've seen this now multiple times, is that when companies get more than they need, they stop focusing. They stop executing. They chase every shiny object that comes up. And every week there's a new project and they never finish anything. 
and they never build product. They never actually are able to get to where they need to go. That's why we say they die of indigestion, more of starvation. Having too little money really in some ways here is an advantage because it forces you to focus. You have to say no 99 times out of 100. And that is essential at the early stages. Later on, when you're in growth phase, maybe not so important after the the B round, but for for pre-seed, seed, series A, my God, take as little money as you have to. Don't take anything more and stay incredibly, incredibly focused. That is probably the one most important piece of advice I've been given that's been very helpful. You'll see this in um, you know how I built this podcast and lots of other places. Mission matters, culture, Trump strategy, and execution is almost everything. I do think that's helpful. I think defining the mission clearly and sticking with that. The companies that I've seen really struggle most struggle not about money, but around culture. And that gets set in the very, very beginning. So you want to think about that intentionally. You really have to get serious about what kind of a world you want to build for you and your employees. Issues like work-life balance, sharing responsibility, communication style. And it's complicated during COVID because if you can't sit together to set up culture, you have to come up with other ways of doing that. Zoom isn't great. There are some tricks that, you know, there are a couple of companies that have developed much more interactive video conferencing, but all these things really matter and they matter at the beginning, but they matter more and more every few months. So getting culture right is critical. Focusing on execution, absolutely critical. And I think this is the last one, but no, I've got one more after this. Successful companies begin with with good governance. And there's a piece by uh, Hemant Taneja, really good VC out of uh, General Catalyst. He wrote a piece last year for the Harvard Business Review about how to build, you know, how to build a startup that lasts. And he makes this point over and over again in the piece that if you go back and you study the startups that are successful, they all built to succeed from the beginning. They put in the right governance. They put in, you know, in the case of a behavioral health company, they worked on the compliance issues at the beginning. They they took the time to get stuff right, right at the start, even though it slows you down and it's a pain in the ass to do a lot of this. It's boring, still needs to be done. Finally, I think it's fair to say, and I'd love your thoughts about this, but this this is really hard to build a startup. It takes 18 hours a day. It is a crazy thing to take on, especially during a pandemic and especially if you have a family, but it's super cool. It's probably, as I like to say, the most bipolar thing you will ever do because on Monday, you're convinced this is going to be a unicorn and you're going to be a bazillionaire. And on Tuesday, you think it's going to collapse. You're constantly uh, building the plane and flying it at the same time. And so Wednesday, you think it's going to wreck. And Thursday, you're soaring again. It is a crazy, wild ride. But people who have done it, not everybody, but a lot of people, they get hooked on it. They love it. And there, there are people who can't do this, who just don't have the DNA to be in a startup, and that's fine. They go into growth phase or they go into big companies like Google or Apple or Facebook. And there are other people who can't stand those companies that have lawyers and and HR departments and all that stuff. And they just want to be in a place where every person has eight jobs instead of there being eight people for every job. So if that's what you love, there's nothing like it. It's quite an amazing experience. If there's time, I'll tell you a little bit about Humanest Care, which is the startup that I'm launching, just launched actually. I think we got our first paying customer yesterday. How cool is that? This is taken from our pitch deck that shift happens here. It's what we're all about at Humanest, which is helping, it's a direct to consumer Peloton for mental health. It's helping people to grow and change and providing stepped care online. So delighted to, um, hear what you guys are thinking about, get reactions from you about any of this. 
All of it is simply my opinion. I have no data to um, defend on most of this, but it's fun to talk about in any case. Quick question for you, Tom. What's the balance when we start? When we're talking about quality of care and delivering things that people want, what's the balance in this space between delivering a science-backed, clinical, data-driven, effective solution? With, you know, that, that's in one bucket. And then being an entrepreneur, going fast, breaking from the status quo, moving fast and breaking things. How do you marry those two things together in a way where we build something that helps people and we make sure that we don't hurt people? So I think that whole thing about go fast and break stuff is, it, it's, I think it makes a lot of sense. Maybe in the social media world, it's a real, you do this in healthcare, it's a shit show. Yeah. You know, you're going to hurt somebody and you're going to end up being sued and you're going to be shut down. Healthcare uh, and health tech is different. You, it's a regulated space and you got to be super careful about what you do. And, you know, it's a lot slower and there's just no way around that. It's very slow. Even getting the initial data and then turning that initial data into a contract, like if you want to work with enterprise, you know, it can be 18 months to get a contract for a pilot with Humana or United. And they're not interested in people going fast and breaking things. They're interested in people who are really careful and protective of their patients and make sure that there aren't lots of bad things happening. I have two questions, uh, Tom. So one of them, I think early on you mentioned um, you used the what if slide of 1,000 plus companies in this space. What's the recipe you would say of the good companies or the qualities of a company that's going to survive out of these 1,000 plus? I mean, now, of course, not all of them will be around in a year or so. The second question I have is around, you mentioned around the, the need and the, the kind of the right solution versus, you know, some of the examples like around a lot of companies are in the access side versus the quality and engagement. How mature is market? And it goes back to even what, you know, you just mentioned about, you know, not breaking things and, you know, doing it from, from an evidence-based practice. How mature the market is, if, if you think from that perspective of, getting a health tech into a quality engagement, all this kind of uh, biomarkers kind of a recipe. Yeah, I think most of those thousand companies aren't going to make it. And there'll be a few who that do. You know, there really haven't been a lot of exits in the behavioral health space, very, very few. And I think we now have about six behavioral health companies that are valued over, or they're valued in like the half billion to billion dollar range. So it's still uh, early days for this space. And so it's a little hard to know who, who are going to be the winners. What I've seen are, I think, companies that have stayed focused, have something that fits into the healthcare system. Although that's not what, you know, what, what I'm doing at Humanest is totally direct to consumer because I'm trying to do a different model. But the ones that have made it so far are either direct to consumer for the wellness space like Calm. It's a really good company, really well run. Or those like Able2 and MindStrong and their help that have sold into employer markets or into enterprise of some sort. And they are able to sell there because they're solving a problem that's there. So the problem for a lot of employers was they had huge demand for behavioral health and they didn't know how to satisfy that demand. Lyra showed up and said, We'll find you the therapist. Just give us the money and we'll take it from there. Tom, thank you so much for coming to speak with us tonight. I'm Mackenzie. And one of the questions I have for you is that you mentioned that one of the concepts and needs of companies is serious mental illness. That's an expensive space. The cost of care gets expensive there. How do we... And then you also mentioned that you know, the system's broken and it's a system designed for payers and providers, not for patients and families, but patients and families are the ones who are feeling all the pain and of serious mental illness. How do you shift the system when the costs, you know, the payers are really the, the ones picking up the bill in a way, or it just, it seems difficult to find solutions to SMI without fitting into the existing system. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, Mackenzie, I don't, I don't know that I have the right answer for that. I mean, we struggled with this at Humanest and we decided we were just going to build an alternate universe 
but that's going to take time and it can take money and whether we can actually do that or not, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Almost everybody was telling us you have to build for enterprise, whether that's employers or insurers. The problem is that if you build for employers, nobody ever uses what his employers put into their portfolios. It's usually less than 3% uptake. Sometimes it's less than 1% uptake. And if you build for the payers, the insurers, you're not giving people what they want. The payers really only care about one thing, managing costs. They want to spend less and less and less. So the only thing they really are interested in paying for is if you can save them money. That's how it worked for, for MindStrong. By the way, MindStrong, I think, is maybe the one exception. It's not the only exception, but they're not a lot. MindStrong has actually focused just on SMI. That's what they wanted to go after. And they did it because they knew that was a pain point for United, Humana, Aetna, all those companies. They weren't doing it well. In fact, they were trying not to do it at all. And yet in Medicare Advantage, they had to take this on. And many of them had Medicaid contracts where they had to take it on. So they were looking for solutions. That, and it, it turns out that it was this, the easy things. You know, It was what saved their budgets, what saved them a lot of money. It wasn't necessarily like giving them complex algorithms for care management. It was giving them like a peer or health coach who would solve the problem of loneliness. People with SMI are very lonely. And they end up going to the emergency room. They end up in hospital often because they're socially so isolated. Uh, Wilfred Crenn from Aware Health. Um, I, I really appreciated a lot of a lot of the things that you said. One of the things that stood out most to me and that we've been thinking a lot about is if you were to just like tear down the whole system and recreate it, what are the things that you would build into this space? And I think the biggest thing is is connection. People like needing to feel connected and supported. I mean, we hear this all the time. I'm, I'm a therapist. And a lot of times the response is like, why would I go to talk to a therapist? Like I would rather talk to a friend. And I think that I think that's a really key insight. But in, in thinking about like how we scale connection, I think right now one of the best examples we have is, is, is social media, places like Facebook which I think we can all agree are not great. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on, is using social media as a model for connecting people valuable? Or do we kind of have to sort of reinvent the wheel to think about how that scales? Well, those are good questions. Wilfred, the first thing I would say is it would be fun. And maybe we can take a few minutes, even in this meeting, to sort of brainstorm what would... Camelot look like? You know, if you were starting over and building a behavioral health system, and I would build it around the three Ps, I think. I think I would really go after making sure people had people, place, and purpose, and really focus on paying for that and doubling down on each of those across the board. But the question about social media, I think, is just super interesting. That That is, in fact, where that 60% of people who aren't in the mental health care system but who need something from that system, that's where they are. Those 60% are on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. And what they get ain't great. You know, In fact, it could be really destructive for them. So when we were putting together Humanist, we talked about this a lot. And we're thinking, like, is there a way that we could build the bridge between, because we the problem we were trying to solve for was engagement. That's like, we wanted to figure out how to get those 60% of people into something that will be helpful instead of all this toxic positivity and doom scrolling and all this garbage that they're being exposed to on social media. And so what we thought is we we would do two things. We would build this bridge. Well, the first thing we did was we, we hired a bunch of very good therapists like really experienced therapists. And we trained them to become influencers on Instagram and on TikTok. So we brought in consultants and we brought in some big time influencers. And like there are things you can learn. You have to buy them ring lamps. You have to train them in how to do short videos. But the idea was for them to begin to provide evidence-based, we call them micro-therapeutics on those platforms and to create a following. And with that following, then they... And it's not a lot, but if three, 5% of their following are people 
who realize that they need something that they're not getting on Instagram and that maybe, you know, a postcard a day isn't really enough for them to uh, manage the anxiety or their depression or whatever it is. They migrate over to Humanist where they can have a community, they can have groups, they have workshops, they can meet with that influencer who is one of our clinicians and is available to see them one-to-one on a limited basis. So the idea was to actually build that bridge and to create something that would link to social media, but be far better than social media, but wouldn't be the mental health care system as we know it. it. Like we don't use diagnostic labels. We don't bill insurance. It is fee for service. It is like, it's like Peloton. It's not for everybody, but if it's, if, if you're trying to like in Peloton, you want to lose weight or you want to improve your fitness, we'll give you your OKRs. We'll give you a dashboard and we'll help you do it. Except in this case, it's on the mental health side, not on the physical health side. So that's kind of the way we've attacked this. I don't know if that's going to work. We have to see. We're just at the beginning. But I think it's really interesting. And I'm telling you all this with the hope that other people will try the same thing because it needs lots of people trying to figure this out. I do think that in 2030, we're going to have a very different behavioral health care system or maybe multiple systems. But I don't think it's going to look like what we have today. I think brick and mortar will still be there, but at a very small to very small degree. There'll be much more continuity. There'll be a whole different workforce of peers who will be much more involved than what you see today. And I, you know, I think with all that duct tape, there is this opportunity to innovate in so many places in the system. So taking the time, this is kind of why I wrote my book, because I was trying to think like, what is it we want? What is the like? What are we working for here? What should it look like? And I still haven't quite figured all of that out, but I do think that focusing on recovery, focusing on social support, as you said, trying to build a system that has some continuity to it, so you're building for a, a lifespan, not for an episode. I think all of that is what will really matter. Hey Tom, I just wanted to thank you for coming today and sharing your thoughts. Um, I'm Rick from Way Health, and so maybe to focus a little bit more on your background specifically, if you were a person who was currently building a mental health or a tracking platform slash a digital phenotyping platform, where's one place that one might start to do such a thing? And if they were thinking about doing it, how would you break down kind of from a cost perspective, maybe like a pie chart of where the major dollars end up going in that kind of business? and where the major pain points are, just like an overview of what MindStrong has kind of trajectory does? Yeah. MindStrong is maybe not the best example. The company, there are a couple of companies that are still very early stage. Kasana, Nick Allen's company up in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, It's K-S-A-N-A. Really interesting to look at. Nick has been an academic working on this, mostly around suicide prevention for like 20 years, 15 years. And it's got just a huge amount of research that he's now putting into the company. Uh, Health Rhythms out of Chicago or Pittsburgh. I think I'm not sure where it's based, but they're also, they've just pivoted to do some serious digital phenotyping as well. I think they, what Meintrong tried to do was to focus on one thing, which was the way you attack the keyboard of your phone. So it wasn't what you type, but how you type. So it was getting the typing, the tapping, the scrolling. And it was working out the algorithms of what patterns were indicative of a, of a relapse for depression or mania or psychosis. It's a cool idea. Uh, it's really hard to do because there's huge individual variation. Different phones have different characteristics. Really hard to keep up with all the changes in software within the phones as well as the hardware as new phones were coming out. We pitched this at one point, early days of MindStrong, we had this hour-long meeting with Bill Gates, which is like the peak experience of my life. He's the smartest person on the planet. And he loved the idea, but he thought, he just thought it was too hard. But he promised that he'd help us with it. And he did in some ways. What I think we learned from that is that it doesn't have to be that hard. There are easier things to do. I think if you simply pick up simple sensors like activity, you get a sense of when people are awake, how much they're sleeping, how active are they? Do they leave the house? This isn't that hard to do. And you can get 
something, if you can do it in a way that isn't creepy, uh, GPS is pretty creepy. Nobody likes that. And in California, we're about we're likely to pass a proposition that will make that illegal to be able to collect GPS. So, you know, it's not likely that that's going to continue to be viable. But I think some of these easy signals are going to be really helpful. But since you asked, the thing that nobody is doing that somebody has got to do is get serious about the use of language, right? Nobody does this. We have this opportunity, especially now with telehealth, right? Okay. <laughs> so looking at, you know, telehealth, you've got, you've got the face, you've got the speech, and you've got the voice. And telehealth 2.0 will be collecting all of that in real time and making sense of it. We have the tools to do this. This is, it's not easy, but it's very doable. And then you can begin to take all the terms that people use in behavioral health, terms like thought disorder, and actually provide objective scores for those things. You can look at sentiment for depression and mania. I honestly have no idea why no one's done this. The academics were doing this a decade ago in places like University of Texas, Austin. John Pennybaker did this back in 2012. He had this nailed at that point. And yet I don't see anybody creating the tools that allows this to scale so that ultimately this becomes like Waze or Google Maps for a nurse in an emergency room or a healthcare worker in Botswana so that they can walk around and they can collect voice, speech, even face, and they can get printouts of behavioral health metrics and even diagnostic metrics that are as good as you'd get from a master clinician. That ought to be the goal. That ought to be the product. Hasn't been done. Anybody who wants to do that, I'll fund your company to do it. I've been looking for people to work on this because it's, when I say, you know, what's it going to look like in 2030? That will be the product in 2030 that will, I think, really change uh, practice because it won't be in specialty care. It'll be in community mental health. It'll be in emergency rooms everywhere else. Being able to predict suicidal risk with objective tools, that's going to happen. And we're not doing it now. So if you like heard that somebody, maybe um, maybe somebody even in this group had put together a collection of all of the mental health posts that had ever been on Reddit. So that's a collection of around 8 million social media objects of natural language conversations surrounding the context of mental health. Um, that would be something of interest to this conversation, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. I think those are the kinds of things that people ought to be working on yeah, so they so can get really, really good at you know, putting objective scores like the, what is it, the LIWC does, right? The, uh, it's sort of an, an engine that gives you a quantitative printout of semantic content and whatever you can tell from voice analysis. I just don't know why we aren't doing that. This is what clinicians do. Clinicians listen for what's said and what isn't said, and they make a diagnosis. They, you know, they figure out what's going on with somebody through their experience. Well, that's duct tape. That's something you can innovate around. This is Charlotte. I, I'm sorry, Tony. Thanks. We're, I know we're running out of time, so I'll make my my question sort of short and sweet. I've been an academic mostly focusing on internet gaming disorder and working with an international team on the academic side of measurement and treatment and trying to open that up to more of a clinical space. And I think what you've been saying is kind of giving me a lot to think about in terms of the model of care. I've been thinking about a stepped or, or nested care model. And I found that when I talk to people, as you've already um, touched on, I can get people very excited about an app and about digital wellness. But when we get to sort of the the more critical levels of care, whether it be in terms of outpatient or residential, I think the brick and mortar part is, is sort of giving people pause or maybe they can have a picture of that. But I'm trying to sort of talk about the advantages to that nested or stepped care model. And I'm wondering for you what your thoughts are about that, if you ha if you had any of them. And then also, if you know anything about, since it's an ICD diagnosis, but not a DSM diagnosis, how that might affect, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't have yeah, I don't actually have a good answer to that part. I don't know enough about how reimbursement decisions are made. And usually it's on ICD, not DSM, but that's probably going to be important for whether the diagnosis gets used or not. Yeah, on the step care, I do think, you know, creating, whether it's online or offline, a range of options that allow people to move in between is super important. 
I'll just say that, you know, it is frustrating that when you get into the brick and mortar and particularly into inpatient residential settings, most of them do not allow people to use phones. So the whole digital phenotyping is out the window if you're trying to collect data from a phone. At least inpatient units generally, just like in jails and prisons, phones are taboo. So that's that does create a challenge. Hi, hi, Tom. This is Neelam speaking from Total Life. Uh, our mission is to provide um, that 60% that's not getting access to therapy, therapy through launching with group therapy platforms across different parts of your life, all on telehealth. One of the questions that we've been um, really grappling with is many therapists work across the range, adults, seniors. And do you think there's a lot of um, importance in starting off with a specific demographic out of the gate, where it be like seniors, the Medicare population, um, and go deep in that vertical, or it's okay because therapists are kind of trained across the board? Yeah, that's a great question. Now, we haven't done that. I think it is a good idea. So some of the companies like Brightline that's doing very well right now just does children up to age 18, and companies that have focused on Medicare, Medicare Advantage populations are doing really well. Uh, it's a great way to go. It does, of course, limit the market, but it gives you a way of defining who you are. So I would, I think, you know, as an investor, I would find that attractive. Hi, Tom. This is Tony Ma from uh, Benton Technologies. Uh, so speaking about the smart speaker system, so we just recently got funded by NIA to build a smart speaker system to measure sentiment analysis, depression, suicidal ideation using that. And so I guess uh, coming from NIMH, what is more important to look and try to get the science and evidence and build that and do the clinical trials or after we finish? So we got a pretty large funding for the phase one of an SBIR. As part of that, uh, we have some of the leading experts in sentiment analysis to really do and look at that and look at voice inflections and those other components to measure depression, suicidal ideation in the caregiving population for people with dementia. So I guess what's more important, trying to get the science or get that technology out and then work about the science later and try to get the clinical trials with your background. So we'd love to hear that. Yeah, uh, well, you know, I, part of the reason I showed that first slide of that long journey of all the places I've been is um, it really, the answer to that question depends on when you caught me. I used to be very focused on uh, academic research and trying to get uh, the very best papers in the very best journals. And what I discovered was that even when you were very successful at that, you had very little impact. It's kind of a bubble. And so the 30 people who read the paper or the 50 people who you know and who you see at meetings are impressed, but a lot of it doesn't go much further than that. So I think that it's the shift from build from writing papers to building products that's going to be really critical. And and when you build products, you have to ask questions that we never asked when I was at NIH, like, who's going to pay for this? And how does this, when I got to Google my first day there, they have an orientation and somebody got up uh, in front of us and said, look, we want to get really clear with you guys. Our measure of success is a product that's used by a billion people every day. That's our threshold. If it's less than a billion, it's a work in progress. Uh, so this whole issue about really trying to build for scale. It's not the way that NIH thinks. Um, there, it's really much more, you know, I think it is important to have that kind of R&D and to have investments in things that could really matter down the road. But there is almost no way that NIH can provide the kind of resources that are, will be necessary to build products that people will love, that will, they'll fall in love with. You need the designers, you need the engineers, you need all the stuff. You can't do it on an SBIR, and it, it does take money. It takes several million dollars to put those teams together. You can put the SBIR, you can get the concept. You can figure out this is, this is viable, this is possible. But to turn it into a product that actually will get adopted, it's got to have all these other stuff that is going to require a company. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to talk to us. My name is Doug. I'm the founder of Empathic Health. And we're building the social infrastructure for the psychedelic medicine movement. Given your experience, you know, as the head of the NIMH and the op-ed that you wrote talking about the benefits you've seen with psychedelic studies, I'm curious how you see the FDA kind of catching up to getting these off the schedule one list and kind of getting with the time, so to speak, of 
you know, seeing the, the evidence that's out there that these drugs do have medical benefit, they have low abuse potential, and just kind of the government and the public sector getting in line with, you know, where science is at today. Yeah, I'll keep this short because I have a lot of thoughts about this. And, and to, I, in full disclosure, I'm an early investor in Compass. So, and I've been part of that company from day one and continue to be very involved with them. So I'm certainly supportive of, of this approach. The FDA uh, gave a Compass breakthrough designation for psilocybin or for their version of psilocybin, which is a huge, huge sign of support. That's an amazing green light for them to realize that uh, they've got enthusiasm from both the FDA and the EMA. So the problem is it's still a long road. What I worry about most is that is the rare adverse event that can happen if this goes too fast or gets used by too many people too quickly. It only takes one event, which could be a black swan. It could be something totally you know, unpredictable that will spook the FDA into not wanting to move this along. As it sits now, uh, we're still a couple years away from being able to file. We're, we're still in the phase 2B. The phase 3 won't start until 2021. It's going to be a year to get all of that put in place. So it's probably 2022 by the time we're ready to file. And there's so much energy for this and so much enthusiasm. It actually makes me nervous. I'm worried that someone is going to do something um, that will create hardships for everybody. So this is this very, for me, kind of anxiety-provoking time, this next 12 to 18 months when um, we're trying to demonstrate rigorously that this is a value and that it is safe, and we think it really is from the normal volunteer study that's already completed. But if this gets used by cowboys doing all kinds of stuff unregulated, we could have problems. So I'm nervous about that. But the FDA so far has really been supportive. And I'm thinking, you know, they're going to treat this like any other drug but they are looking for new tools. They're looking for new opportunities in treatment of refractory depression. So they're, they're going to be, I think, really helpful. You know, look, I, I just want to say thank you for, for being here and for spending time with us on your, on your evening here and uh, for sharing these insights that you've gained. I mean, you've probably got more experience in this space from a number of different perspectives than, than really anybody. So I really, I'm really grateful. I learned a lot, and I hope that everyone else did too. Well, thanks. Uh, listen, anybody who wants to follow up, it's Tom at humanestcare.com. And uh, I'd love to hear from you. I'm always looking for ideas to invest in or people to partner with. And as we've been saying all the way through the hour, man, we need some innovation here. So go for it. Thank you again to Tom for joining us as a guest of the What If Fellowship for your advice, help, guidance, mentorship, not only to me, but to so many in our field. And a special thank you for letting me share this conversation broadly as I know it will be extremely helpful to many who seek to build solutions and to help advance the cause that's extremely personal to both you and I. To our listeners, thank you for being here. And if you like the content, please share us with a friend or leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. For the mental health startup founders listening, if you could benefit from a little help getting your business off the ground, then check out the What If Fellowship. This is a program that was mentioned several times during the episode. The fellowship is a program designed to help facilitate increased company building within the mental health space. We aim to help mental health startup founders accelerate the process of going from an idea to a real plan to execution and then to funding. You can learn more through the, the fellowship tab on the What If Ventures website or via the link in the show notes attached here. With that said, please don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions or comments. You can reach out to us on Twitter at StigmaCast on Instagram at Stigma Podcast. You can email us info at stigmapodcast.com and you can find us on our website at stigmapodcast.com. Thank you again for being here. Until next time, stay safe, be well, and thank you for your support. Thank you.